So we perceive that people are more anti-immigrant today, but Pew has been doing um, polls on Americans' perceptions of immigrants since the 1990s. Um, and today, right now, is the most pro-immigrant America has ever been. Um, in the data that they have. So in the 1990s, um, the majority of Americans were saw immigrants as a drain on the country. Um, whereas today, the majority of people, um, not the majority, but a plurality of people, see immigrants as a benefit. Aloha, I'm Robert Perkinson. I'm a professor in American Studies at the University of Hawaii at Manoa and coordinator of our Better Tomorrow speaker series. And I'm talking today with Reese Jones, my colleague in the Department of Geography and Environment. Um, he is a prolific and thoughtful and influential thinker and researcher on immigration restriction from India to Israel to the United States. He's the author of two previous award-winning books, Violent Borders and Border Walls. He won uh, Guggenheim and is on fellowship this year. Congratulations, Reese. And he has a brand new book out. Um, titled White Borders, Race and Immigration in America from Chinese Exclusion to the Border Wall that we're going to be talking about today. Thanks so much for joining us, Reese. Aloha. Thanks for having me. I wanted to start with kind of the yellow elephant in the room, the Trump administration. Um, there was so much chaos, um, so many policy initiatives that struck many observers as cruel and, and maybe more explicit racism than we've seen in immigration policy debates in the U.S. in recent decades. But your book, which I read and greatly enjoyed, was troubled by and learned a great deal, argues that the racist roots of immigration policy go well beyond the Trump administration. And I was just wondering if you might lay that out for us briefly. Yeah, absolutely. The Trump administration was certainly a kind of far extension of the, the racism that's inherent to the immigration system in the U.S., but it's the roots of that system is racist exclusion. If you look back at the history of U.S. immigration laws from Chinese exclusion through the present day, um, each different round of laws is about excluding non-white people from being able to enter the U.S. Um, I was really struck by the fact that you kind of draw these continuities, not only to racism, which in present day discourse, I think we're talking a lot about the way that systemic racism has punctuated and been pervasive in American history, but you also talk about the way that eugenics has, has lived on, which I think most people think of as, as having fallen out of favor with the Nazis finally and not really having much influence left. But um, what is the interplay between eugenics and immigration policy historically? Yeah, so at the turn of the last century, um, eugenics was a dominant way of thinking in U.S. universities and in U.S. society. The idea that different races were superior to each other um, and that those, those it was inherent um, uh, superiority is passed down through individuals. And so the early immigration policies in the U.S. were about protecting this idea of a white racial purity from the threat of other people arriving in the United States. So the 1924 Immigration Act, which is the, the big one that puts in place national origin quotas across all different countries around the world, um, is completely shaped by eugenics. The, the committee that was doing uh, the, the writing up the policy, they had a eugenics agent on the committee to advise them on eugenics um, in terms of creating the categories for that particular law. Um, and that law has continued through the present day. Our current immigration system is based on those um, quotas that were started in 1924. They've been changed, they've been altered, um, but they've remained in place through that entire period. Your book is you know, primarily a work of history, um, but it was conceived at this convulsive moment in American history. And I just wonder what propelled you into the book first? What did you think of it in the Trump administration? And to what extent does that, did that shape the, the way that you designed it and wrote it? Yeah, absolutely. So I started to think about this project as Trump was running for president and as he was framing his 
um, entire campaign based on the racist idea that we need a border wall to prevent people from crossing the border and entering the United States. And so I decided to take a look back and see how does this fit within the history of immigration laws in the U.S. Um, and I was troubled to find that, that it's really a reversion to the past and um, kind of bringing back a racist version of who should be an American that a lot of people thought had been sent to the dustbin of history after the civil rights movement. Yeah, but the dustbin came back. With um, a vengeance. I think it would also be helpful, before we dig deeper into your book, to just talk very briefly about your other two, because they also kind of help us put together pieces of the puzzle globally and in the US. So tell us just briefly about your the intervention your first book made, um, so we have good context before we go back in time to Chinese exclusion. Yeah, so my first book is called Border Walls. It came out in 2012. Um, and what I did in that book was to think about why countries around the world were starting to build border walls um, in the first decade of the 21st century. Um, because after the fall of the Berlin Wall, there had been the perception that walls were something of the past. It was something that totalitarian governments did. It wasn't something that democracies did. Um, but in the book, I look at the US, Israel, and India and look at the walls that they were building and try to understand why these walls were going up. And they have been going up all over. Is that right? yeah. like how many wall projects, border fortification projects are there now? Yeah, absolutely. So. Um, the, I worked with a scholar, Elizabeth Vallée, at the University of Quebec at Montreal to count up the number of walls around the world. Um, and we found at the end of World War II, there were about five border walls anywhere in the world. Um, as late as the year 2000, there were about 15. Um, when my book, Border Walls, came out, there were 35. So the number had doubled in the, those first 12 years of the, the new millennium. Um, but today, there are about 70. So it's doubled again since that book has come out. So it's countries around the world wow. are putting up walls on their borders. So what is briefly the reason why the proliferation now of border fortification, right when globalization promised so, and digital commerce supposedly makes borders less significant than they might have been. Yeah, it's absolutely part of the same thing. Globalization is both the opening up of the world to an extent that hadn't ever existed before in terms of the free movement of capital, um, the free movement of corporations around the world, and the free movement of wealthy people around the world. But it's also meant a closing down of borders for the poor. Um, and so the reason we see these border walls is because there are mechanisms to prevent the poor from moving mm -hmm. um, and accessing higher wages, better working conditions in other parts of the world. And your, your second book? So the second book follows right on that because as I was working on that book on border walls, I also noticed that there was this dramatic increase in migrant deaths um, as these walls were going up. And so in the second book, Violent Borders, mm -hmm. I try to understand why borders have become these really violent spaces. Um, and the those numbers continue to increase. That book came out in 2016. Um, the AP did an investigation of migrant deaths from 2015 to 2018 um, that counted 56,000 people who died at borders during that period of time. So it's over 10,000 people per year are dying simply trying to move from one place to another. So in that book, I try to understand why that was happening now, but then also trace it back through a history and understand what the relationship is between movement restrictions um, and the protection of privileges. And are those deaths even more common in sea borders rather than because the, I, I just know in the news you're reading about whole ships full of people sinking regularly. Or um, so is a, are a lot of these deaths concentrated in Europe and the Mediterranean? A lot of them are. Or really a lot of other places as they're, well? They're in a lot of places. Certainly the highest number is in the Mediterranean mm -hmm. lately. Um, and many people say that the numbers that we use when we say 10,000 per year, that that's certainly an underestimate because many people die when a ship sinks in the Mediterranean. There may be no record of that. Um, right. Or also people who die at the <clears throat> US-Mexico border, um, if their body isn't discovered within a very short period of time, they're, they're lost in the desert um, and they may never be recovered. So certainly the number is much higher. Right. Okay, so I wanna go back to the foundations. Um, I feel like in this Black Lives Matter movement, there's been more reckoning in popular discourse with systemic racism, violent racism, lynching, and the legacy of slavery. Um, not as much, although still some, with the anti-Chinese racism. Um, maybe people are beginning to come to grips with how pervasive, how many people were killed 
you know, just how convulsive that period was. Um, but again, you argue, I thought, dis distressingly, that, you know, Chinese exclusion is not just this shameful period in American history, but it's really foundational to all the ways immigration policy is formulated going forward. What, and what do you mean? Why is, why is that history of anti-Chinese racism so foundational? Yeah, I may go back just a little bit further. Okay, because, sure. Um, I think that a lot of people assume that countries, the United States, other countries around the world have always had immigration restrictions. Um, but the reality is that the United States did not have any restrictions on who could immigrate into the United States um, for an, until 1875. Um, so from the, for the first roughly 100 years that the country existed, there was no restrictions on who could enter the country. And were there the citizenship, because there's that 1790 citizenship, white only citizenship law, what, how does that fit into what you're saying? Yeah, absolutely. There were restrictions on who could become a citizen in the United States. So people were free to come, free to work, free to live in the country, but to become a citizen, to join the polity, um, the 1790 um, Nationalities Act um, said that you had to be a free white person to become a citizen. Um, and then after the Civil War, by 1870, um, African Americans, freed slaves were also added to that. Um, Chinese were not part of that. Right, okay. So the Chinese exclusion era right. becomes important because it's the first group of non-white people who start to arrive in the United States in large numbers. So for that first 100 years, there was immigration from Europe, people coming from England and Germany at first, later Ireland, um, even later on, starting to come from Southern Eastern Europe, Nordic countries as well. Um, but there was not a large number of people arriving from other parts of the world in the US. So the idea of having open borders and free immigration um, during that era wasn't something that concerned uh, many, many I see. People. So even though there's all this anti-Italian and anti-Irish anxiety and xenophobia, it doesn't result in national policy formation in terms of immigration exclusion until, until the anti-Chinese racism really takes, takes flight. That's right. There were, in the early decades of the 1800s, there were some uh, anti-poor immigration rules that individual states put in place, Massachusetts and New York. But in 1849, the Supreme Court ruled in the passenger cases that it was a federal government job to do immigration restrictions. So from 1849 until 1875, there were no restrictions on who could enter the United States. Um, okay, well, tell us about, you know, what are the key pieces of legislation we should know about from the beginnings of this restriction? Um. So you have to look at the gold rush, right? So when the gold rush happens, uh, James Marshall discovers gold in 1848. In 1849, people from across the U.S. and Europe start to make their way to the West Coast, to California, to look for gold. Um, the U.S. has just claimed California from Mexico in the Mexican-American War. Um, and so what starts to happen is Chinese people also start to make that trip across the Pacific um, and come to California. And first it's a few hundred people, um, but within a few decades, it's 20,000 people per year coming to California. Um, so for the U.S. as a whole, it's a really small number of the population, but in California, it equates to 10% of the people are Chinese by the 1870s. And other states too, like Idaho, and have huge Chinese populations, right, by the... Oregon, Maybe. Washington, Nevada, mm -hmm. yeah, those are the, the ones where this issue is, is big. Um, and so it becomes this key political issue on the West Coast about this Chinese question and what to do about the arrival of these non-Chinese people. If you look at the arguments at the time, the parallels with what we are seeing today um, are shocking. Um, the, the language that you hear today from Republicans about an invasion, about immigrants bringing diseases, about immigrants um, taking American jobs, but also immigrants being, bringing drugs and being lazy, every single one of those things was used to describe the Chinese in the 1880s. So this anti-Chinese racism results in legislation, also in violence. Are there particular episodes that you think are really important for people to know historically? Yeah, the 150th anniversary of one of the most significant events in the West Coast um, is coming up in October, October 26th. Um, in 1871 in Los Angeles, uh, there was a small Chinese community in the city and a conflict started between um, a couple of Chinese people at first, um, but eventually a police officer was shot, a white police officer was shot in the process. Um, and in the aftermath of that, 10% of the city of Los Angeles showed up in the 
Chinese neighborhood, ransacked all of the buildings, um, destroyed over 500 houses, um, and they also killed 19 people um, and lynched 15 of them, um, which is the largest mass lynching that happened in the entire history of the United States. And the result, tragically, is not that the country rallied to condemn the racism, but actually put into law uh, much of what they were demanding. So, you know, where does the federal legislation really take take shape that institutionalizes yeah. this kind of xenophobic racism? Yeah. So the, the United States' first immigration law is the 1875 Page Act. Um, and the Page Act bans Chinese laborers from coming to the United States um, and effectively bans Chinese women as well um, from entering the U.S. Um, the laborer part of it is turns out to be relatively easy to get around. Um, and so um, seven years later, in 1882, um, Congress passes the Chinese Exclusion Act, um, which bans all Chinese people from entering the United States. Um, one of the things I, your book is very troubling. Um, and sobering and therefore a call to action. One of the joys in reading it is we get to meet a lot of larger than life characters. And um, so I was wondering if you might introduce us to a couple of them here. There's this kind of um, prototypical Trump character, Dennis Kearney, that I thought you might tell us about for a moment. Yeah, Dennis Kearney is an immigrant from Ireland um, to the United States. Um, he ends up in San Francisco um, and founds a group called the Working Man's Party. Um, and he becomes this rabble rouser who is just uh, really great at giving these speeches and, um, and uh, getting the crowd riled up about this particular issue. And if you look at his speeches that he gave in, in uh, 1878, he made a tour of the East Coast to try to get support on the East Coast for this effort at Chinese exclusion that was, was so strong on the West Coast. Um, and his speeches, I mean, it really is, it's a playbook for Trump. He starts out each of the speeches by um, criticizing the press and getting the audience to turn around and boo the press and wow. punch the press um, during the, the start of it. Then he uh, criticizes capitalism and the way that's affecting workers, kind of the way that Trump talks about China and trade. Um, and then he will always end his speeches talking about the Chinese um, and all the, the diseases that they bring. Um, and his catch line was, and whatever happens, the Chinese must go. Um, and he ended his speeches like that and would walk off the stage. There were also, though, instructively, um, prominent individuals who, you know, spoke up with even national platforms. Um, are, there, are there some, at least, heroes in your story? So, yeah, There's one example would be, <laughs> um, there was a Massachusetts Republican Senator, George Frisbee Hoare, um, who in 1882 was an uh, absolute um, opponent of the idea of Chinese exclusion. Uh, he thought it abhorrent and completely in conflict with um, the ideas of the Declaration of Independence um, and in the Constitution of the United States. And um, he gave these uh, kind of really eloquent speeches on the floor of the Senate um, where he essentially argued that all people on earth should be able to freely move across the entire face of the earth. So um, kind of a vision for, um, for, for open borders and free movement during that era, which of course is what the United States had at the time. Right. Um, and in one of the speeches, he talked about how um, that the, the, the country should really only judge immigrants by their character uh, as a person rather than their color of their skin. Mm -hmm. Um, which the, the language of it really evokes Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech um, 80 years before. Um, so um, it's, uh, it, it was really heartening to read um, people yeah. standing up to Chinese exclusion at the time. Okay, so Hoare's exhortations notwithstanding, um, there's this surge of populist anti-Chinese racism that radically changes U.S. immigration policy and introduces these restrictions for the first time that then stay with us. Um, how does then social science or pseudoscience in the form of eugenics start entering into these policy debates? Yeah, well, so what happens with the immigration laws? Each time one group is banned, a new group kind of starts to take the role of labor that they had served. So when the Chinese are banned, um, within a few years, um, there's an increase in Japanese immigration to the United States. And so there's very quickly an effort to ban that sort of immigration. Um, there are the Irish coming and the Italians coming to, to fill these labor gaps. And then eventually it's Mexicans coming to, to do that sort of labor. And so each time there's this new round of laws to close off those same avenues 
avenues for people to enter. Um, and a lot of it is justified based on this idea that the United States is a white country. Um, that's how people during that era would, would phrase it. Um, and that any immigration that is not white to the United States is a threat to that um, the um, Henry Cabot Lodge, who was a senator from Massachusetts, the way he phrased it is immigration is a threat to the very fabric of our race. Um, and that the United States is duty bound to prevent that, to protect this idea of a pure, unadulterated white race. Okay, so that's an, an and then the, who, who are some of the intellectual eugenicists who start to come to the fore and have an influence on these policymakers? Yeah, so most of the thinkers at many of the universities are writing in the general realm of eugenics. So it's, it is a common widespread idea during this period. Um, probably one to, to talk about is Madison Grant. Um, he was not a scholar, but he wrote books based on scholarly work. He was a um, naturalist, so he was really uh, interested in protected areas in the West for endangered species like bison. Um, and he came up with this idea that essentially the white race was an endangered species as well. Um, and that the threat to the white race were these people, these non-white people coming to the United States. Um, and so his big idea, he, had, he wrote a book that came out in 1916 called The Passing of the Great Race. Um, and his idea was that essentially the US needs really strong immigration restrictions like a protected area for an endangered species yeah. to protect this stock of the white race. Um, so at the same time, okay, so these, these debates are happening in Congress among elected officials. They're happening among academics pervasively, it sounds like. It's a dominant kind of strain of thought and research. Um, it's happening in the streets, too. How is the second incarnation of the Ku Klux Klan in the 20s kind of also related to anti-immigration policy making. Yeah, so the, the Ku Klux Klan, of course, it was founded after the Civil War, um, and it was a group that was a separatist group, essentially, in that first round of the, the Ku Klux Klan who terrorized black people, former Confederate soldiers. Um, it gets put down by Ulysses S. Grant um, in the early 1870s. The second iteration of it comes at, in 1915, after the film The Birth of a Nation is released, which glorified the Klan. Um, and so a pastor in Georgia um, decides that he needs to restart it. And so he um, starts a new Klan, um, but the characteristics of the new Klan, they still retain the anti-black racism. That's absolutely fundamental to it. Um, but the new Klan is much more of a patriotic organization. It's about um, white American Protestantism. Um, and so the threats are immigrants, blacks, um, but then also um, communism and things like that. So it's immigrants a, from Catholic countries, which is all of Latin America and Southern Europe, I guess, too. Absolutely. So for them, Italians are a huge threat, right, coming from um, from Europe. And so um, the second iteration of the Klan becomes this really it grows exponentially um, in by the early 1920s. They've got um, hundreds of thousands of members across the United States. Um, and um, they show up for these mass rallies. In 1925, there was a uh, Ku Klux Klan rally in Washington, D.C., where they marched in front of the White House, and um, there were 50,000 people who came to that rally. Um, and so they are the kind of voice on the street for the need for these immigration restrictions, because allowing these non-white people into the U.S., they perceive as this threat to what to them is the quintessential American identity. Okay, so then how do all these forces then coalesce into the 1924 Immigration Act and, and what should we know about it? Yeah, so the 1924 Immigration Act, it comes after World War I. So in 1921, um, the U.S. passed emergency quotas um, to limit uh, refugees coming from Europe mm. into the United States, um, primarily Southern Europeans, but also Jews was the target of that. And so they put in these um, quotas that capped the number of people arriving to 3% of the population in, in a previous census. Um, and so it became clear that they, with, there was popular sentiment towards immigration restrictions. Congress was in favor of it. The labor movement was also in favor of it based on the idea that, that immigrants were taking jobs from Americans. Um, so it was clear they were going to pass a law. 
Um, and so in the early 1920s, the question was really just how restrictive is the law going to be? Um, and the answer was very restrictive. And interestingly, it's not explicit, like the law is not written in explicitly racial terms, right? But the, the way that the quotas are set, who's excluded, who's included, makes it, you know, a, a clearly white supremacist piece of legislation. Who's left out, first of all? So all Asians are banned in this because the law says that anyone who cannot become a citizen based on that free white person or um, African-American criteria is not allowed to immigrate to the United States. So that bans all of Asia um, off the bat. Um, and then they create quotas for the rest of um, the world based on the number of immigrants to the United States um, in the 1890 census. Um, and they pick 1890 because that's before Southern Europeans and Eastern Europeans come. I see, okay. So places like the United Kingdom get a very large quota. I believe it was 35,000 people, um, which only a third of it gets filled per year. Um, and then other countries like Greece or Italy, which had very low number of immigrants in the 1890 census, get tiny quotas. Greece, for example, only gets 100 people per year. Okay, so but there were lots of African Americans in the U.S. before 1890. How are Africans then excluded? What's the logic there? They just don't count them. Yeah, they don't count them as immigrants because um, they are there as a relic of slavery. They're not immigrants to the United States. And so when they're calculating the data for these quotas, they only count um, white immigrants, essentially, as being legitimate um, immigrants to the United States. Okay. Um, I was troubled to see how much the Nazi party and Hitler personally was kind of struck by this piece of legislation and saw it as a kind of model. Did they, to what extent did they take this up? Yeah, so Hitler was in jail in 1924. He'd gone to jail on April 1st of 1924. For the um, Mirhal Putsch? Yes, exactly, okay. for his, his first attempted coup. Um, and then, uh, so he was in jail writing Mein Kampf while this immigration law passed. Um, and so in Mein Kampf, he talks about the, the 1924 Immigration Act of the United States and praises it. He points to it as a model for what Germany should do um, to prevent immigrants from being able to enter the country um, and kind of protecting this idea of a pure um, white race. Fast forward kind of, to the, like what gets us to the civil rights movement and period because, um, you know, among the great victories of the civil rights movement, the Voting Rights Act, the Civil Rights Act, Another one is we often think about is the 1965 Immigration Act that kind of um, breaks apart these racially discriminatory national quotas. How did we get to that being passed? Like, how was that big pivot made? Um, you know, and how much of a revolution really is that act, or does it have some of an underside also? Yeah, so the 1965 Immigration Act finally gets rid of those national origin quotas that were put in place in 1924. Um, they revised them in 1952. So in 1952, they added uh, small quotas for Asian countries. Um, and in 1952, they finally removed free white person from the citizenship okay, regulations. Okay, so what year is this again? 1952. Right, that is late. Also, we should point out that Hawaii and Puerto Rico are also excluded, right, from and all of the immigrants that showed up in those territories are also excluded from these national Yes, quotas, because right? in 1924, they're territories, not right. states at the time. Yeah, so that's not, not part of it. And also, there, even, um, there was um, uh, uh, birthright citizenship existed. So even the, the Chinese immigrants who, they, more people couldn't come, but there were Chinese who were citizens because they were born in the U.S., they didn't count them either in those quotas in 1924. So it was a really restrictive quotas yeah. um, at the time. Okay, so there's some opening in the 1950s. And then, you know, to what extent is the 1965 Act a, a great triumph of multinational pluralism? Yeah, so, well, in 1964, the U.S. passed the Civil Rights Act, which included, um, the, said the government couldn't discriminate based on race, religion, but also national origin was listed as one of the things that the okay. government couldn't uh, discriminate on. But the immigration law still was based on na discriminating on national origin, right? So it was in violation of the Civil Rights Act. So um, they set about uh, reforming it in 1965. And so the 
um, Immigration Act passed that year. And so what they did was to remove all of the quotas um, and instead set up hemispheric quotas. So there's a quota for the Western Hemisphere and a quota for the Eastern Hemisphere. Um, they also changed the types of immigration to family reunification is the primary mode for people to be able to immigrate to the U.S. So if a U.S. citizen is here, they can bring their family members to the U.S. Um, and the reason they did that is they thought it would mean more white people coming to the U.S. Because in 1965, the U.S. population was, I don't have the exact figure in front of me, but on about 90% white at the time. And so the thought was that the majority of people that would be coming through family reunification would be white. Um, that turned out to not be the case, the way that it, that it actually played out, but that was the intent of it. Um, and the 1965 law also is the first law that makes Mexican immigration um, illegal into the United States. Prior to 1965, Mexicans were free to enter the United States um, at any time. Um, they couldn't work necessarily. They had to get work permits for working, but they were free to come and go in the United States. So 1965 puts the first limits on Mexican entry into the United States, which goes into effect in 1968. I see. Okay. Um, yeah. And so when does the, when does border enforcement really, I mean, I know there were these during the Great Depression, there were these periods of roundups and deportations. Um, but is, so was it really with, with the 1960s and, that we start seeing the formalization of agencies and law enforcement that's kind of regularly patrolling the border and, and it, more greater numbers? Yeah, it's, so it's earlier than that. So the first immigration um, agents at the border follow each of these laws that we've been talking about. So the first federal agents to patrol the border are set up in 1904, um, and they're called Mounted Chinese Inspectors. Um, and their job is to ride around in border areas, look for Chinese people, and inspect their documents to see if they're allowed to be in the United States. Um, there were no border inspectors before that because there were no rules about who could enter the United States before that, right? Anyone was free to come in. Um, so there was no need to have a check on who was doing that. Um, there were customs inspectors at ports checking goods coming in, but not the people. Um, the Border Patrol is set up in 1924. It's set up two days after the national origin quotas are established. Um, and so um, its express purpose is to enforce these racial rules, eugenics-based rules about who could enter the United States. Um, the other way to think about that is that the Border Patrol is less than 100 years old, right? So that's, that's only 97 years ago that the US right. had any sort of a Border Patrol um, on its borders. Um, and it really ramps up, though, as you're suggesting, after Mexican immigration is restricted in 1965. Um, so by the early 1970s, there start to be mass roundups at the border where we see hundreds of thousands of people apprehended um, based on these new rules from that 1965 Immigration Act. And are the partisan lines familiar in the 1960s when they're making all these compromises about how to set these hemisphere quotas and who's included and who isn't and restricting Mexican immigration. Are the, are the partisan lines as we see them now already kind of established or, or is the Democratic Party still split between racist Southern Democrats and how did the legislation get through? Yeah, in 1965, the only people who voted against it were uh, segregationist Southern senators, and they were mostly uh, Democrats still okay. at that time. It wasn't until the late 60s, early 70s that they make the switch to the Republican Party. And when does the Republican Party start mobilizing against immigration? That's later. Yeah, that's definitely later. The, um, the, that's what I look at in the third section of the book, is right, to okay. understand what brought us to this moment, right? Um, and it really starts, surprisingly, in the environmentalist movement. Yes. Um, so the, the early anti-immigrant movement in the US starts with environmentalists who are worried about population growth. So there's a Stanford um, professor named Paul Ehrlich who wrote a book with his wife that came out in the late 1960s called The Population Bomb. Yeah, and that was a huge bestseller, right? Yes, book. hugely influential book. Um, it's a driving force in the first Earth Day, for example, um, is, is the interest in environmental protection that that book brings about. But essentially the argument of that book is a, a false idea that there's not enough resources on Earth to uh, take care of the entire population and that we need to get the population under control through population restrictions, right? So you can probably see that eugenics 
underlying idea is right there, right? That the, um, the, the basic idea is there are too many people in brown and black countries having children, so we need to control their birth rates to prevent those people from overwhelming us. Um, so the early anti-immigrant movement emerges in that, right? That um, the, there's a man named John Tanton. Yeah, he's one of your central characters. So he, he enters into this through the environmental movement? Yes. So he is a um, environmental activist. He's very influential in the Sierra Club, um, Autobahn Society. Um, then Paul Ehrlich has a group called Zero Population Growth. Um, and so this fellow John Tanton is involved in all of those things. Um, it, you had mentioned before some of the characters in this book, and he is the biggest character, um, just a, a, a fascinating and infuriating um, And person. amazingly influential. What is he, a dermatologist or something? I can't remember. <laughs> Ophthalmologist. Opto okay. Yeah, so, yeah, th that's the thing about this guy is he's he's probably the most influential person um, that over the last 50 years that most people have never heard of. I had not. Um, and so, yeah, so he lives in upstate Michigan, and he's an ophthalmologist. Over his career, he does 4,000 eye surgeries, um, and he's also this environmental activist. But in the early 1970s, he gets the idea that it's not just population growth is a threat to the global environment, but that immigration driven by that population growth around the world is a threat to the American environment. Um, and so in the mid 1970s, he decides that there needs to be strict immigration rules in the United States to prevent these people coming into the United States and for him destroying the American environment. Um, it, it takes on for him also, even though he's starting in this kind of what we think of as progressive sector, it starts becoming for him personally more explicitly white supremacist as his advocacy progresses. Is that? Yeah. So or? it's it's there the whole time. Right. Like okay. like I was saying, the Paul Ehrlich's work has that eugenics underlying it. And it certainly does for Tanton as well. Um, but he tries to hide it. Right. So in the late 1970s, Tanton realizes there's no one really working on this. Um, that the idea of immigration is something that has bipartisan support. Um, for example, in 1980, the U.S. passes the Refugee Act, which creates this refugee quota for people to come to the United States um, with, with support across both sides of the, the parties. Um, and he's infuriated by this and sees it as a fundamental threat to the character of the United States. Um, and so in 1979, he starts his first organization, which is called the Federation for American Immigration Reform. And that's still with us and still huge, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, yeah, still exists today and uh, is a very influential group. They're regularly interviewed in the New York Times and on national public radio. Um, but it's also designated a hate group by the Southern Poverty Law Center um, and it has been since 2004. Wow. So is it through that organization and his advocacy that the right wing of the Republican Party starts to realize, oh, maybe they can you in the same way that they use this kind of coded racial rhetoric with respect to crime and welfare and so on, that they could use immigration as a way to bolster their appeal to conservative white voters. It absolutely is. But before we get to that, because okay. um, he does that, um, but yeah. let's uh, let's talk a little bit about how we got there. Right. So um, in the 1980s, he is this dogged um, fundraiser. And so he realizes in order to spread the word about this immigration reform that he wants to do, um, he needs money to do it. And so he spends the entire decade in the 1980s cultivating donors. Um, so he gets a lot of money from Warren Buffett, for example, is a is a Warren Buffett since on the board of FAIR in the 1980s. Okay. Um, but a whole series of other people. But the most important one um, ends up being Cordelia Scaife May. Um, who is another another character? Quite quite yes. bizarre character. Um, so she is a Mellon heiress. Um, so the Mellon fortune um, in the 1990s, she was said to be the richest woman in the United States. Um, but she also shares this kind of eugenics, um, conservative um, co conservation ideas with Ehrlich and Tanton. They become group of friends. Um, and so she, by the 1990s, is funding Tanton's anti-immigrant um, effort across the United States. And with what kind of money? What kind of money are we talking about here? Yeah, so she gives uh, hundreds of millions of dollars okay, to the lot. group. Um, and then when she dies in 2005, um, she donates her entire estate to, his, um, to, a, to a foundation, Colcom Foundation, with the mission to fund these groups. Right, well, I was interested that they decided, they made this kind of strategic or 
choice to not try to conduct all of their advocacy through FAIR, but using the same streams of money set up all of these other organizations. Like, how did you come across, how did you figure out this whole blizzard of organizations that they had put together and how they were connected to one another? Yeah, so I think that's one of the, the geniuses of what he did because by the mid-1980s, he realized, okay, he's got FAIR to do the advocacy, um, but if he's just got one group talking about this, it's still a voice in the wilderness. Um, and so he realizes he needs to set up lots of different groups. Um, and that's what he does over the late 80s through the mid early 2000s. So um, most of the major anti-immigrant groups in the United States were all founded by John Tanton. Um, so FAIR, um, then there's the Center for Immigration Studies, which sounds like a think tank, right. um, but it's also labeled a hate group by the Southern Poverty Law Center. Um, Numbers USA um, is another, they do grassroots advocacy. Um, he formed uh, groups to focus on law. Um, and then he focused, created a lot of these other small kind of specialty groups. So there's like one called US Tech Workers, um, which they argue that immigrants from India are taking away tech worker jobs, right? So it seems like it's this whole other thing, but it's founded by um, right. Tanton, right? So it's all part of his network. So founded by him and funded by Cordelia Scaife May's money. So he started all of this partially because he felt like there wasn't this kind of anti-immigrant advocacy that he wanted. There was a, it was a blank space. When, and he gets all of this money, when does he start really gaining traction among prominent elected officials and in you know legislatures in Congress? Yeah, so his first effort are anti um, or English only laws, um, which are successful in Up various in parts 80s, of the country. Right? Exactly. So yeah. he's the one funding all of that. All of that okay. is coming from him right. and Cordelia Scaife May. Um, then Prop 187 in California is um, he's behind that and the money behind that effort. Um, but it's really in the 2000s that his group started to have a lot of the influence because Cordelia Scaife May passed away in 2005 and she leaves $420 million to this foundation, the Qualcomm Foundation, um, and their donations to each of these groups double overnight. Um, so in the early 2000s, they're getting, you know, a hundred, couple hundred thousand dollars per year. Right. Um, by the late 2000s, they're getting $10 million per year. Um, and so they start to use that influence to stop a lot of bipartisan immigration efforts. And so here we start entering into the stage some characters people will have heard of. Um, Jeff Sessions, Stephen Miller, Steve Bannon. Like, to what extent were these architects of the of Trumpism in policy um, funded by or influenced by this Tanton network prior to the Trump campaign? Deeply. So um, Jeff Sessions becomes the key point person in the Senate for anti-immigrant efforts. Um, and I don't know how well you recall, but in the um, there was a period in 2007 where there was going to be an immigration reform bill, 2006, 2007. Then again in 2013. In both of those instances, there was bipartisan support for it. Republicans were for it. Democrats were for it. The media represented it as if it's going to just pass, right? Um, and it did pass, passed the Senate um, each time. Um, but the Tanton organizations put out this full court press. They bring out all of their supporters, which is and a lot. Seem of, like they're from all different organizations. Exactly. So first of all, yeah, it seems yeah. like there's six different organizations working on this, and people calling from all these different groups. Um, they um, they set up a way for their supporters to all send faxes to Congress on the same day, um, and so Congress gets um, like several thousand faxes about the need to not do comprehensive immigration reform. Um, and so Republicans start to realize our base is against this, hmm. or they think, right? right? But in reality, it's a really small group of people um, that are organizing this thing to make it seem like this vast grassroots effort against immigration reform. And so in both instances, they're able to kill those reforms. Do they start having an influence on the polling data too? Like, you know, as they are fabricating opposition, do they start also creating real opposition? So that's actually the interesting or thing. Or does that come later? So we perceive that people are more anti-immigrant today, but Pew has been doing um, polls on Americans' perceptions of immigrants since the 1990s. Um, and today, right now, is the most pro-immigrant America has ever been. 
um, in the data that they have. So in the 1990s, um, the majority of Americans were saw immigrants as a drain on the country, um, whereas today the majority of people, um, not the majority, but a plurality of people see immigrants as a benefit to the country, more see it as a benefit than a harm. So then how so much discipline in the Republican so what they were able to do, though, is to draw in that Republican base, right? So there's this kind of connection between talk radio, where there are a lot of conservative voices um, that are very influential in shaping conservative, um, the kind of the base of the conservative party. Um, and uh, they focused on that, right? And they turned that idea so that by um, around 2010, 2011, 2012, Republicans realized their base is against immigration um, and their base is riled up by this issue. Um, and so they start to campaign more on it, to talk about it, right? Because they want to give the base what what they want. They need the support of the base to win their elections. Um, and so it kind of becomes this self-fulfilling thing where the right goes further and further um, in the direction that Tanton had wanted them to mm -hmm. since the early 1980s. And now Trump comes down the escalator. Um, so what do they, you know, this group of people that originally were in the wilderness, now they're kind of coming more into the center of policymaking sessions. And his, was Stephen Miller his chief of staff in the Yes. So, yeah. So Stephen Miller is very closely tied to the Center for Immigration Studies, which is one of the um, Tanton network groups, one of the big three of his groups. Um, he, before Trump even ran for president, um, Stephen Miller gave the keynote address at one of their um, conferences and um, his Stephen Miller's emails were leaked a few years ago, and um, it showed that he emailed with people at one of the Tanton Network groups at least once a week um, for the entire year and a half that his email were leaked. So um, over, you know, over 70 times he sent emails to these hate groups. Um, and during that how explicit is the white supremacy within, you know, this, this Tanton Network circle and policymaking circle? Like, what evidence did the Southern Poverty Law Center use to designate these groups, yeah, hate so, organizations. Yep, so th they have their criteria that um, they have to have designated hate directed towards a specific group of people. Um, so out of the Tanton Network groups, FAIR and CIS are designated hate groups. Um, Numbers USA, the third big one, is not designated a hate group yet because they haven't crossed whatever line that is that the Southern Poverty Law Center uses. Um, a big factor in that is a lot of Tanton's writings. So he donated all of his papers to the University of Michigan. Um, and so his letters from the 1980s are all available there. Um, and he was in direct contact and regular contact with white supremacists throughout that entire period. Um, Tanton also, in addition to taking money from Cordelia Scaife May and Warren Buffett, um, he also took money from a group called the Pioneer Fund, mm -hmm. um, which had been set up to fund white supremacy. Um, they funded like white uh, citizens councils in the South. They tried to uh, reverse Brown versus the Board of Education. Um, and he received um, over a million dollars from that organization in the 1980s and 1990s, which is a white supremacist group. So how does Trump then become the vehicle for this? Yeah, so it's this kind of interesting because they they initially um, in after the 2012 election when um, when Obama won, um, Stephen Miller um, and Jeff Sessions uh, met with uh, Steve Bannon, um, and they made they plotted how are we going to bring this immigration issue back up to the front. Um, Bannon thought that Jeff Sessions should run for president, but he decided against doing it, um, and they eventually realized that. Trump was there and was talking in a lot of those same sort of ways. Um, and so they jumped onto that train right away. Um, so uh, Stephen Miller left Jeff Sessions' Senate office and became um, a, the speech writer um, and also the warm up act for um, Trump during his campaign. Jeff Sessions was the first senator to endorse Trump for president. Um, and by August, as the lead up to the, the campaign, Steve Bannon took over as the chief executive of the campaign. I detail this is the dream. If you're like activists, yeah. suddenly you've got a candidate. But absolutely. But their goal initially was not so much to win so much as to just bring these ideas into the mainstream. Is that I don't think that they thought they could win. Right. It yeah. was, is about continuing to move the discussion further. But then by that fall, they realized that they could. Right. And so 
um, there's a there's a meeting that I detail in my book where they they hold an immigration policy session um, at um, to to advise Trump in August about what his immigration policy should be that fall during the campaign against Hillary Clinton. And every single one of the people that's at the meeting um, is connected to the Tanton network. Um, so all of them have these connections to these hate groups. Um, so that was the entire brain trust of his campaign. What about the, in your opinion, you know, this is something that social scientists are going to be debating for a long time, but, you know, what about the build the wall or the o other simple sloganeering that Trump put forward, do you think resonated and allowed him to build support sufficiently to win in 2016? Yeah, um, I think build the wall was effective because it was so simple, mm -hmm. right? He took all of these really complex things, right? Like globalization and jobs being outsourced, that's a border issue for him, right? And then immigration and people coming in and taking your jobs and culture changing and everything like that, that's an immigration issue, right? But you can talk about all these complex things that are happening, but he didn't do that at all, right? For him, it's a simple solution. You just gotta build the wall mm -hmm. and it'll stop all of that, right? And so um, it's, it really is the, the, the perfect example of kind of campaigning in, in Poetry is maybe not the right word, right? But that, uh, uh, you know, of, of finding that slogan that symbolizes this whole set of ideas in a way that can connect with just an everyday voter. Then once he, you know, is victorious, um, you argue that the Tanta Network effectively takes over all of the architecture of immigration policy in the U.S. How? Like, and how fast does it start? So Stephen Miller is the key player here. Um, as soon as he gets into the White House, he sets up this Friday working group where they meet every Friday in the Roosevelt Room, which is directly beside the Oval Office. Um, and they use that meeting every Friday to do planning for what they can do the next week to put in more immigration restrictions. And so um, in that Friday working group are a number of people who are part of this Tanton network. Um, so. I spoke with the Southern Poverty Law Center about this, and uh, according to their records, this is the first time ever that someone who had previously worked for a hate group was hired into the administration of the government. Um, and there were over a dozen people who worked for one of these Tanton Network groups that's designated a hate group that gets a job inside um, the, the administration. And what do they, you know, they don't get any kind of landmark legislation. Um, what do they accomplish? Well, Muslim ban would be the first thing, right? They put the Muslim ban in place the first week that they were in office. Um, and eventually that is upheld by the Supreme Court. It's a case from here in Hawaii, right? It's um, that, uh, that eventually loses at the Supreme Court and the Muslim ban stays in place. Um, they, although they didn't build a lot of new border wall, Trump did replace a lot of the sections of the border wall with a much more um, substantial structure. So there's certainly that. Those are the visible things. Um, but what they really did was that... Well, the child, I mean, another thing that people will remember is the child separation from parents kind of trying to, or, trying to choreograph deterrence with how people were treated when they arrive. Absolutely. So that's the no tolerance policy, which yeah. is a Jeff Sessions policy, someone very closely tied to the Tanton network. Um, and uh, yeah, that policy was to separate, automatically separate children from their parents when they cross the border as a way to deter other people from trying to make that trip. Yeah, absolutely. Um, was something that was at the front of the news. But those are the headlines. I was troubled to see how deeply they were working, you know, even in the way forms are printed and processed and the sort of effects that had. Like how, how you know, deep did these Stephen Miller machinations go across agencies and? So it went very deep. So they, um, the, the Tanton network officials that end up in the government end up in a few particular agencies, right? They're at ICE, the Immigration and Customs Enforcement, um, and they're at USCIS, which is the one that handles like immigration policies and processing documents and things like that. And they're in the Justice Department. Um, but the, in the end, um, scholars who are keeping track of the changes um, counted over a thousand different new policies that altered the way that immigration worked for the U.S. and they're all about restricting the number of people that can enter the U.S. Um, you mentioned the forms though. I think that's the, um, if you could just pick one example of, of the ridiculous changes that they made and how it affects people. Um, they put in place a policy um, in, I believe in 2019, that you can't leave blank spaces on immigration right. forms that you turn in. 
right? Which, okay, that seems like maybe that's reasonable. You shouldn't leave Nobody things blank, it. right? But, um, you know, but, but what that meant is there's like, there's a place, for example, um, for a middle name, or there's a place for apartment number, right? At your address. But if you live in an address that doesn't have an apartment number, you might just skip over that blank. But you're right? supposed to put not applicable or something exactly. according to this new rule. Yeah, so if you just left that blank, even though you don't have an apartment number or you don't have a middle name or you don't have five siblings that there were blanks there to fill out, um, they rejected it as an incomplete oh God, application, maddening. right? And so, um, yeah, you had to put NA and it had to be capital NA. If you did lowercase NA, they rejected it. So how much has the, how quickly has the Biden administration moved you know, to identify these thousand plus changes and rewrite them. Um, and how much are they keeping on the books? I would say they're moving way too slowly in this. Uh, I mean, I think that the Biden administration has been relatively progressive in a lot of areas, um, more progressive than people thought they were going to be, um, except for immigration. Um, so one of the most egregious examples is that they, they have kept Title 42 in place. So Title 42 is a health care regulation that says that the government can turn away people at the border for a health emergency. And so they put that in place during the pandemic, during the Trump administration. Um, and the Biden administration has kept that in place um, through now. Um, a couple of weeks ago, a judge um, said that they had to stop doing it and that it was illegal. Um, but then they have um, contested that in court. And so they're still trying to keep that in place. Um, Is it through this mechanism that they're keeping refugees outside of the country while they go through the... So they're process. using it to mean that they don't even have to process refugee applications, right? That they can just automatically send people back based on this healthcare regulation. So something like a third of the people who've arrived at the border have been sent back with any, without any sort of processing based on Title 42. The, un, you know, there are all these changes that Trump made in the administration, that the Trump administration made. Um, but the, the rhetoric was also newly energized and, and the, the racial kind of um, tone to it sharpened under Trump. Like, t to what extent you, use, you look a lot at this language of race suicide and, um, you know, um, great replacement that animated the immigration debates of the 1920s. To what extent did Trump bring some of that language back and how much is it have other Republicans kind of jumped into that same rhetorical parade? Yeah, I think one way to think about that, if you think back to the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville in 2017, um, that was an event that was universally condemned. Although Trump did kind of hold out a hand to those people, most people condemned what was happening there. What, what were they saying at that rally when they were marching with the the torches on the University of Virginia campus, um, they were chanting, you will not replace us, right? So saying that um, immigrants will not replace white Americans in the country. Um, and at the time, it was something that was condemned. Um, this week, though, we've seen a lot of Republicans using that exact same sort of language. So earlier this summer, Tucker Carlson talked about immigration using replacement language, the idea that immigrants were going to replace white Americans. Um, Elise Stefanik, who's the third ranking person in the House of Representatives, released an ad last week um, talking about immigrants replacing Americans, um, white Americans. And so um, it's concerning to me how quickly this language that was um, fringe that was banished to the edges of white supremacy, something that was not acceptable to say in public discourse after the civil rights movement, um, has been brought back in. And I think you can definitely see the Tantan network laying the groundwork for that and then Trump opening it up and making it possible to, to say these things again. So there's this racist and eugenicist origins of U.S. immigration restriction and a resurgence of more explicit racism um, as the immigration issue has become more polarizing. That leaves us in not a very good place. But looking beyond the horizon, but on the other hand, you, have, you point to this kind of hopeful polling data that at least Americans broadly don't share those kind of anti-immigrant sentiments that are guiding at least the right. Where do you think you know, what's the, your hope for a, on a longer time frame for how to disentangle immigration policy from these through lines of, of racism? Yeah. So the 
the underlying argument of my book is that the origins of immigration restrictions to the United States are racism, that it was about excluding non-white people to the country. Um, and if you look at how people who are in favor of more immigration restrictions talk about it today, they're talking about it in racist terms still. So um, the what I would like people to take home from the book is that immigration restrictions are fundamentally a racist thing. It's a thing that has been used to create a white definition of the country. Um, and it's something that people who believe in white nationalism want to um, put in place even more today, right? So that um, when we talk about Black Lives Matter, when we talk about a different version of what the United States could look like going forward, um, I think that immigration restrictions need to be part of that conversation because they've been a tool of white supremacy for over 100 years. So the, the Democratic Party in the 1960s kind of turn from the late 1960s finally turns against segregation. Um, the Democratic Party quite recently has turned against mass incarceration, the mainstream of the party. You know, what do you think needs to be done within the Democratic Party to kind of extinguish the the lingering and still defining racism within immigration policy debates? And, and how much do you think can be done? Yeah, I think the I would point first to the data on welcoming immigrants that the the data is trending towards a more favorable view of immigrants. Um, and that if you look at what percentage of the population are um, talking about immigration in these racially defined terms of great replacement, um, you know, it's a fraction of the Republican Party, right? So it, it's maybe 20% of the U.S. population that has these strong, racist, anti-immigrant views. That means that 80% of the population does not share that, right? right? And so um, over the last few years, we've allowed that loud um, racial extreme to define our conversation around these issues. We elected one of those people president, right? Um, but going forward, we don't have to continue to raise those voices up and listen to that perspective and instead emphasize more the benefits of immigrants, the diverse history of the country, and the contributions that they make to society. If build the wall was kind of hate poetry, distillation of an idea, are there, are there framing suggestions you have for you know, politician, politicians and advocates when they're talking about immigration to try to settle people's minds and have them think clearly? Yeah, I think, I mean, one is to talk about the long history of benefits that immigrants bring with them to society. Um, the, you know, I, I'm a scholar and so I focus on data. And if you look at the data, um, more immigrants is beneficial to the country in all sort of ways, right? They, they benefit the economy, they grow the economy. Mm -hmm. um, there's no economic reason to limit immigration at all. The con right? To the contrary. Yeah, it's, it's beneficial to, right. to allow more people in. So it really is a racial position to, to do that. So, um, you know, but I'm not a politician. And so maybe I'm not the, the person that's the greatest at coming up with particular slogans, but someone has to be able to do that. Okay, thank you, Reese, for your wisdom and insight and all of your hard work on this issue. Um, I hope your ideas get more traction. You've certainly built a, a base on which uh, a movement for more sensible and tolerant immigration policy can begin to take shape. And maybe these racist roots can be finally broken. So thank you for all your work. Thanks, Robert. I hope um, so. The Better Tomorrow series is a joint venture of the University of Hawaii Manoa, Kamehameha Schools, and the Hawaii Community Foundation. I want to thank all of the people who made this possible today, the staff of the Better Tomorrow series, and also the College of Social Sciences du Digital Studio that's hosting us today. Um, we host a lot of conversations soon again in person and online on important issues in different fields. We hope you'll join us, and we thank you for joining us today. Um, take care.